we'll start off this morning with our first panel on urban computing. The goal of urban computing is to harness computing technologies to improve urban environments. And in particular, right now, we will hear about the use of AI technologies and how they can be applied in the urban space. We have three panelists this morning. The first is Dan Hoffman, who is Montgomery County's Chief Innovation Officer, responsible for creating programs that generate innovative ideas for the county. Next, we have Steve Smith, who is a research professor and robotics director at the Intelligent Coordination and Logistics Laboratory at Carnegie Mellon University. And thirdly, Pascal Van Hentenrich, who is the Seth Bonder Collegiate Professor of Engineering at the University of Michigan, holding joint appointments in Industrial and Operations Engineering, CS and Engineering, and at the Michigan Institute of Data Science. Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't have any slides. I'm just going to speak to a few points that I think are relevant. Uh, you might have noticed looking at the agenda, I'm one of the few um, local jurisdictions. We have a, a lot of great talent from university. So I'm going to focus my uh, comments uh, mainly on what we're seeing in terms of the day-to-day -day governance aspects of these issues, some early deployments, and some of the ramifications that we uh, will see in the next uh, 5, 10, 20 years. But first, I'm going to, for those of you especially who are from out of town, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to Montgomery County, Maryland, which is just to the north of here, um, and why a, a county is up on the stage and why it's uh, very analogous to a lot of the city use cases that you might see. So Montgomery County, we're one of 20 some odd counties, Montgomery counties spread across the country. We're just over a million people. Uh, we have a $5 billion budget, about 500 square miles of land. Uh, we are very diverse. We have urban, suburban, and rural built environments. Uh, we are very analogous to what you might find in a Charlotte or a Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, even in some cases. Um, but we just have a different uh, built environment pattern. And what I do for Montgomery County, I work for the county executive. Uh, I run <clears throat> the innovation program, which it really, uh, for us, is the civic R&D lab. It's where we uh, pilot, prototype, proof of concept, different projects. We operate what we call the Things Institute, our Internet of Things lab, uh, where we partner with uh, private companies, startups, uh, and the federal government, the National Science Foundation, uh, has been a strong partner. NIST has been a strong partner. White House OSDP has been a strong partner. Uh, and what we do is we establish test beds uh, in those real world environments. Already you've heard this morning uh, the difference between the lab environment, theoretical uh, solutions, and how does something operate in the real world. Uh, Montgomery County has a fleet of buses, we have police cars, we have libraries, we have social workers, we have correctional facilities. Uh, those are all uh, public infrastructure, public institutions that we open up for, for testing. So uh, as a quick pitch, if you are looking to uh, operate some type of research project and you're looking for a willing partner, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and that built environment, I think, gives you almost the uh, the, the Pleasantville of research, oper uh, research opportunities. Um, because we do have an urban environment in Silver Spring and Bethesda that's, that's relatively dense, dense as many cities, uh, we have your standard suburban sprawl built in the 70s and 80s, built around the vehicle, around the car, and a rural environment. It means we operate test beds in agriculturally oriented test beds, uh, transit oriented test beds, um, correctional facilities, senior living facilities where folks are aging in place. Um, and what we're beginning to see is that <clears throat> the, at the moment, uh, the technology isn't necessarily the issue for us. It's really the, the policy and some of the, those unintended consequences that are slowing things down more than anything else. Uh, I'll start with, with transportation. There's going to be three main areas I touch on where I think there is tremendous opportunity for social good, uh, but a lot of uncertainty. Transportation is the big one. I think you're going to hear a lot about that uh, throughout the course of the day. Uh, autonomous, V2V, V2I will change almost all aspects of governance. Uh, but how do they really impact uh, public transportation, for example? 
we invest in Montgomery County in particular, we invest a significant amount in public transit. Uh, you probably are also well aware of uh, the challenges of the Washington Metro system as well, but we operate a, a public bus fleet and what will an autonomous bus mean to residents? Uh, really this, the AI for social good in my world means the interface between people and their government. What does it mean for a resident to get on a, an autonomous bus? The barrier to entry for someone to get into an autonomous taxi or an autonomous Uber is a lot lower than potentially a bus. Uh, what is the social compact between uh, the government and its residents when they're getting on one of our buses with 40 or 50 other uh, neighbors of theirs uh, on that bus? What does that mean for acceptance? What does that mean for adoption? Uh, and when we do buy buses or build bridges or build parking garages, what does that mean for retrofit? Uh, our parking garages we build with a useful life of 40 to 50 years. That's an incredibly long time scale when you're talking about technology. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars for one garage that might be useless or obsolete in 15, 20 years within half of its useful life. Uh, and to complicate things even, even more, we issue bonds assuming revenue off of that parking garage. So we're starting to think about the role of a public transit. How do we police an autonomous uh, system? Uh, how, do we, um, how do we plan for the, the registration and uh, <clears throat> operation of a system that is now autonomous? Our signaling, all of our adaptive signaling, all of that changes and we are only beginning to understand how we could be equipped from a human capital perspective to handle that. Another area is uh, health and human services. Uh, we're beginning to tinker around with very, I would say, low level AI aspects um, related to the, the Amazon Echo, for example, as a virtual social worker. Uh, starting to understand what is our, um, what is one of our residents who's aging in place, what is their interface with potentially a virtual social worker, and what kind of data can we gather um, safely and securely that might help us identify issues before they occur and deliver some degree of service. Um, another area is corrections. We spend a tremendous amount on correctional facilities, but we really do not understand uh, especially on a national level, the types of interventions we apply in a corrections and rehabilitation setting. This is an area where computer vision can play a huge role in safety. Um, and you've heard a lot about precision medicine. This is an area where precision, precision corrections and rehabilitation can save us a lot of money. There's a huge return on investment if we rehabilitate uh, someone in our custodial population correctly. Uh, the workforce development aspects are also dramatic, especially when you're talking about no longer needing um, auto body mechanics because you have way fewer accidents, when you no longer need taxi cab drivers, freight drivers. Uh, how do you maintain the public infrastructure that's now instrumented in collecting data? Um, and then I'm gonna end with just the privacy, policy, and trust as aspects. Uh, our residents, they're, they're expecting this. They've watched way too much TV over the last five, 10 years. Uh, they are expecting us to already be doing many of these things. They're expecting us to be able to track their vehicle. They're expecting us uh, to already be watching them, for better or for worse. Um, and I think unless we can understand what data is truly sensitive and what the policies and procedures need to be put in place to correctly access that data so we can get the right data to a firefighter on his way to an incident so that we can identify uh, a vehicle in the transportation system that might have abducted a child. All of, that type of th all of that type of data could be used for social good, but right now it is off limits to us, or at least the combinations and permutations of it are off limit to us um, because there aren't the policies and procedures in place to effectively tap into it. So I'm gonna stop there, that's my time. I look forward to questions. Okay. Uh, how do I get my slides to run here?
This is the agenda, I guess. Right? Uh, can someone? Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Great. So, um, following on uh, some of the points that Dan touched on, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, work we're doing in smart infrastructure for urban mobility. You know, as as more and more. Uh, uh, people uh, move uh, to urban environments, and you know, we're seeing this, this kind of trend. Urban mobility becomes a, a more increasing uh, issue and uh, important uh, aspect of the uh, fabric of, of living. Um, I guess I don't really have to convince anybody in this room about uh, the problem of traffic congestion. I've, I've driven through DC enough. Um, a recent uh, study um, annual mobility report uh, estimates that uh, in, in U.S. cities nationwide, uh, the, the cost of congestion is, is $121 billion in terms of lost time and uh, fuel consumption. Uh, also estimate that we pump about 56 billion pounds of CO2 into the air annually as, along with uh, a number of other uh, toxic uh, elements. Another study, um, let's see, how's this? Oops. Yeah. Another study, estimate, recent study estimates that uh, we spend 40% of our time on surface streets in urban areas idling in, in, in traffic. So uh, it's, it's definitely a big problem. Um, and, um, you know, a typical, uh, you know, one, one might think the typical. Uh, uh, transport, uh, traffic engineering kind of perspective of building your way out, you can't really do that in, in, in urban environments. Uh, you know, we have land use issues, which is just not the capacity to build. So somehow um, we have to uh, take other kinds of action that can kind of move traffic more smoothly. Well, one of the big, uh, fortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, one of the big reasons why we have congestion is poorly timed signals. If I look at uh, the vast uh, majority of intersections, they run on fixed plans. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of uh, characterized a snapshot of, of traffic volumes at, at a particular point in time. We go out and collect timings, and, uh, and then there's some kind of a timing plan that's built uh, for allocating green that, that sort of runs in a fixed, a constant way. Uh, so these, these capture average conditions, um, and, and these conditions change sort of dynamically uh, and begin to evolve as soon as these plans are put into place. So they begin aging. There are, uh, you know, as Dan was mentioning, there, there, there are some uh, traffic signal systems with adaptive capabilities. These also have fairly uh, inherent limitations. You know, sort of the most common form of adaptive control is called actuated control. Basically, um, that's a, you know, you're detecting traffic that's sitting stopped at an intersection and moving it. This is good, this is good for the uh, yeah, middle, middle of the night, you, you know, not sitting indefinitely at a red light, but um, it loses the opportunity to anticipate traffic in advance. Uh, other kinds of adaptive systems uh, tend to be uh, uh, organized uh, as sort of central parameter optimization kind of systems and uh, they're unable to, to respond to real-time events. So, you know, typically pulling information back into a central office, kind of integrating information over time, and then adjusting parameters every 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, those systems, th those few systems that are aimed at real-time traffic control are typically designed for arterial settings. These are really like, essentially highways with traffic signals. So. Um, you know, you have a dominant uh, uh, flow that you know about and, and you can plan for it accordingly. Um, so uh, for the last five years, my group has been kind of looking uh, at, a, at a better solution, focusing specifically on urban, uh, urban road networks, grid-like road networks. These are more complex uh, because in, in a grid network, you have multiple competing traffic flows that change through the day. So you can't anticipate these in advance. Your system has to discover these and, and move on. Um, we take uh, a online planning uh, approach. Uh, you know, so, uh, we've been evolving a technology we call SureTrack, Scalable Urban Traffic Control. SureTrack combines 
uh, ideas from uh, artificial intelligence, specifically automated planning and, and multi-agent systems with traffic theory, uh, providing kind of a new, uh, a new approach. Uh, so we um, operate in a totally decentralized way. Each, each local intersection controls itself, uh, and then intersections communicate with one another to uh, get coordinated, coordinated behavior. So the fact that uh, each intersection is locally, inter uh, locally uh, controlling its own situation gives us really true real-time response and the, uh, the, the communication between neighbors um, gives us this ability to dynamically sort of adjust to the, whatever the dom dominant flows are. So let me give you an eye sense. Here's a sense of what signal control looks like as a, as a distributed online planning problem. Here um, we actually put uh, computing power at the intersection. We put it, uh, what is called an intersection scheduler there. Um, it, perceives in real time traffic conditions, in this case from uh, video camera feed. Uh, and then that, that, that's, that scheduler uh, in real time computes uh, a timing plan, uh, a plan for allocating green to different approaches, uh, and then starts to execute that plan, starts to send commands to the actual hardware controller. That's the physical device that runs the traffic lights. At the same time, it communicates what now it expects to be sending, its outflows, it, uh, what it expects to be sending to its downstream neighbors, its, its downstream neighbors doing the same thing, it's computing its local plan, but now it has an expectation of um, what's coming behind the, the vehicles or the traffic that it can actually see through its sensors. So it can plan with a longer horizon. And then, uh, and then this whole process sort of iterates in a rolling horizon fashion every couple seconds. So uh, this is not the, the first time that an uh, online planning uh, strategy has been attempted, but the real innovation here is uh, a formulation of the intersection control problem as a single machine scheduling problem that allows us to solve it orders of magnitude faster than was previously possible. So we can actually keep pace with execution and move that. Uh, we first uh, Pilot tested this technology uh, uh, in the uh, East Liberty region of Pittsburgh uh, in June of 2012 on a nine intersection um, grid in the East Liberty section uh, of the city. There are really three dominant flows here. There's the east-west flow you see uh, that uh, on, on Penn Avenue moving this way. There's the west to north uh, flow uh, on, on Center Avenue and then coming from Shadyside from the bottom up particularly at PM rush, there's a third kind of uh, uh, dominant flow. So th this is the, and you can see that um, uh, the, the results I'm showing here are comparisons that we achieved by sort of doing drive-throughs of, of the highest volume routes in the network, uh, you know, different times of day, different days, with the system turned on and turned off. So this is really a comparison to the pre-existing uh, pre situation. You can see that we get varying amounts of improvement over different parts of the day, but overall, uh, the improvement is fairly significant. Uh, reduction in travel time, 26%. Uh, not so much because vehicles are going faster, that's kind of a typical concern, but, but rather they're, they're waiting and stopping much less frequently. Um, and from an air quality point of view, we're also uh, re doing significant reduction uh, in emissions. This uh, system's been operational since June 2012. In uh, November of 13, we sort of exp did an initial expansion of this network, moving east along Penn, uh, the Bakery Square area, this is kind of where uh, local high-tech Google Pittsburgh uh, is starting to emerge. Uh, you can see the topology in the network is quite different, uh, where the original one was very compact. This is a little more arterial. Okay. Um, and uh, you can see that we get pretty much the same results. Um, since then, we've expanded a couple more times. We're currently, as of last fall, operating a network of 50 uh, intersections in East Liberty, and actually plans are, are, uh, are uh, in place uh, to, to do further expansion. Uh, Pittsburgh is a finalist in the Smart City Challenges, uh, Department of Transportation Smart City Challenge, uh, if it's one of seven finalists, and this is kind of a, a, a taken from the, the current Pittsburgh proposal, you can see that we, uh, the technology would, would expand much more pervasively. So maybe I'll stop there. Yeah.
Uh, good morning. So I'm very pleased to be talking about AI for social good today, and I'm going to talk about the, the role of AI in mobility again, like the previous two speakers. So this is what I'm going to. This is the outline of the talk. I'm going to start with some motivations, and then I'll I'll talk about some technology enablers, uh, and then I'll talk about a case study, and if I have the time, about the projects that we are uh, starting now. Uh, so the motivation here is all about the. Uh, what access to transportation, uh, the, the impact of access to transportation in our social lives. In a sense, uh, access to transportation is one of the critical factors for upward social mobility in the United States. So it's more important than crime or the quality of the schools in a neighborhood. In fact, uh, car ownership is still the best predictor of upward social mobility inside the United States. Uh, so let me move to healthcare now. About uh, 3.6 million people every year uh, don't have access to medical care, not because the care is not available, it is actually in those cases, but just because they don't have access to transportation. And I'm not even talking about continuous care, continuous disease management and things like this. Uh, if you look now at, at, at nutrition, uh, there are about 21 million people in, million people in the United States who, who don't have a supermarket within one mile of where they live. And so if you don't have access to transportation, what that means is that these people are forced to shop in convenience stores predominantly, which also means that although these you know, convenience stores are very useful, they don't carry the same quality of foods that you have in supermarket typically. So in fact, in Detroit, there is this uh, supermarket chain, Prince Valley Market, which is actually offering these days so, you know, Uber drive, Uber, Uber rides, for you know, any customers which actually spend more than $50, $50 for shopping there. So what I'm trying to articulate here is that if you have access to transportation, what you get is better you know, upward social mobility in society, better access to healthcare, and better, access and better, better nutrition, better, you know, healthier food. So the challenge here that I'm trying to address here is can we actually build cost-effective and, and convenient transportation system which, which would be addressing these three issues that I just you know, talked about. And so what I'm going to show you is that we are at a unique time in, in, you know, in our lives where there is a convergence of technologies, many of which are AI technology, for actually addressing some of these challenges. And I'm going to go over some of these challenges, for some of these technology enablers right now. So the first one is obviously connected vehicles. So we are you know, accumulating massive amount of data, which gives us unique, in gives us unique insight about you know, how people are traveling, what the infrastructure are doing, congestions, and many other things. Also, these cars can be given instructions at this point, which also enable us to do system-wide optimization of, of transportation system. Automated vehicles are going to become more and more important, and, and this is primarily, you know, there are many other aspects, but this is primarily a cost reason, and I will address that a little bit later in, in, in the talk, but this is one of the primary drivers that they will actually uh, give us. And finally, you know, a lot of progress in analytics, and, come in, and a lot of that is, is coming from AI again, is, is going to be able to drive these transportation systems. And this, this comes from you know, better data mining algorithms to understand activity-based models of mobility for people. This is you know, better forecasting model, better models of congestion, and then better algorithm for system-wide opti you know, optimization for designing the system and operating them in real time. So I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, so let me, let me mention one case study to, to just try to make sure that you know, this is not a pie in the sky, you know what I'm talking about. So this is a project that we run in Canberra. Canberra is the capital city in Australia. It's in between Melbourne and, and Sydney. And it's built in the middle of the desert by this uh, American architect, Walter Griffin. So it's built from scratch about 100 years ago. And it's built around this concept of self-contained communities. So a lot of different towns, and they have their own supermarket, they have their own infrastructure, their own facilities for almost everything. And in between them, there are you know, vast areas of green space. So from a you know, social you know, standpoint, this, this gives you a, a great sense of space. But when you look at public transportation, it's essentially a nightmare because the city is widely geographically you know, dispersed. It has very long roads for the bus. Therefore, the frequency is low. Because the frequency is low, people don't like to take the bus, and therefore, you know, they cost a lot, and nobody is happy. So what we tried to do is trying to find a solutions to that. And so what we did was building a hub and shuttle system. So essentially, instead of having about 120 road, you know, bus routes, so what we did is having a few hubs. And in between these few hubs, there were high-frequency buses. And you know, probably in the future, some light rail as well. 
And then to actually get people to this bus, this is a typical first and last mile problem which plagues most of the transportation systems around the world. What we are using is shuttles, or in this particular case, taxis. So the taxis are basically picking up people. People order the ride, you know, essentially online. And then they are picked up at the traditional bus stop, brought to the hub, and then they do a bus ride, and then there is another taxi waiting for them to bring them to their destinations. So one ticket online and the same price as the transportation system, about $2.5. Uh, so this is an animation of the system uh, that you see there. Uh, so you're going to see two hubs. There is a hub there. There is another hub there. The blue things are the bus. The taller they are, the more people they are. The more people they are at the hubs, the more people are waiting. And all the busy bees around are essentially the taxis synchronizing with the bus. This is based on real data uh, that we, you know, because the system in Canberra is highly instrumented. So we have data on all origin destination pairs. So let me talk a little bit about the benefits of this system. Uh, so this is essentially what you see on the left, on the, on the right here is the actual system. What you see on the left is the cost of the new system. So the cost in terms of the buses is about a tenth of what it used to cost. The rest of the cost is essentially the taxi and we are paying full fare for the taxi. So the day automated cars are available for actually servicing this particular on-demand transportation. Essentially the price is going to go down by a factor of 10. Uh, the time that you see for service is typically the, the, a particular commute trip is going to be bas basically divided by two. And so that's or, or sometimes by three because this is not taking into account the weight for the buses in the actual system. So what you see here is reduction in cost. You can also compute the reduction in CO2 and also uh, dramatically improve service uh, for people commuting uh, through public transportation. Uh, there is a live trial which is planned not in this part of the city, in the place where the politicians are actually living. Uh, later this year. Uh, so let me talk briefly about what we are trying to do now. We are trying to look exactly the same system now uh, for the Ann Arbor region. I'm going to skip some of these slides uh, quickly. But in a sense, what we are doing is once again a system which is synchronizing high, you know, uh, on-demand uh, shuttles, uh, on-demand cars, and then light rails and high-frequency buses. Uh, once again, the key point is addressing the first and the last mile problem. So what you see here, what I'm going to show you here is essentially uh, some of the buses of the city, if, uh, actually in Ann Arbor right now. And so the, the, f the first experiments that we did, the first computation we did, was once again showing exactly the same thing in Canberra. So if you use an on-demand transportation, you are going to reduce the cost of transportation, improve service, and also reduce uh, 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 CO2 emission. So let me try to uh, conclude at this point. Uh, if this, so what, what, I think, what I think you have at this point is a convergence of technology, many of which are AI technology, which are going to transform public transportation and transportation in general. Uh, addressing the first and last mile problem, addressing congestion as Steve has talked about, because now we can control fleets of vehicles in a completely uh, holistic fashion, and then you know, viewing mobility as a service in general. Uh, we have a lot of the technology enablers which are available or will become available in the next five to ten years. And the case study shows that this is not a pie in the sky. So we have evidence that this can actually uh, be happening in practice. And obviously I'm not talking about many other opportunities like electrical vehicles and holistic infrastructure information where there will be uh, other you know, synergies for reducing cost and for reducing um, green emissions and, and things like this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, as Anne has told you, you can tweet your questions, but I will get the questions started. So maybe I'll start with you, Pascal. You had a nice slide on analytics, which kind of flashed by, uh, mentioned uh, prescriptive, descriptive, and so on. So can you talk a little bit about what AI is bringing to the table beyond what data scientists are already doing? Because when I think of analytics, I typically think data science. So what, what is AI bringing to the table? So I think what you see, what, is yeah. this working? So what, what we see here is that we, we, have, we have a lot more information, now, a lot more data. We have terabytes of data on, on just what these cars are doing, about what people are doing. Just actually mining that data is a, is a challenge. So I think you know, there is a lot of progress in the AI community, in the data mining community for actually having very efficient ways of actually mining this data. You know, you can't look at the data, it's just too big. 
And then afterwards, you need very good predictive, predictive models. So why, why you know, is, the, is, the, is the system behaving this particular right. way? Can you predict how people are going to travel at different times of the day? Mm -hmm. And then you use these predictive models together with optimization technology you know, to operate the system and design the system better. So I think it's a lot of AI technology in various ways. There are a lot of technology from other disciplines as well. But AI is playing a very prominent role in actually designing this data mining, machine learning, and then optimization tools that you need to operate these networks. And then building. <laughs> and building those systems in a prescriptive way. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Right. So it's, a, it's a very nice integration of actually uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics once you have analyzed what, you know, what the system is actually doing. Right. Thanks. Yeah. If Do I could like, just uh, yeah, please maybe add. add a little bit to, uh, you know, from my perspective, we're, we're very much interested in real-time control, and uh, there's a wealth of data that's running through our, our traffic signal system and... Uh, you know, in, in the longer term, as we connect to, to vehicles, if we start talking to vehicles and, and get additional kinds of information for sensing, um, there's a lot of opportunity to kind of turn that data into kind of actionable evidence. So uh, I think one of the big distinctions I see between pure data mining and uh, the kind of things we hear is that we're trying to close the loop and really turn uh, information into kind of actionable control uh, data or information. And one of the things that we're looking at, not just in transportation, uh, but across all of these areas, is uh, the, the unintended consequences. There's obviously huge social good uh, and potential benefit here, especially in that last mile, mobility for folks that either uh, can't afford a vehicle or, or whatnot. But uh, we've seen so far in some of our early research the potential for um, you know, the unintended consequences where certain groups are either uh, profiled or focused on or left out entirely. So uh, a good example, though it's not AI, is 311 systems. You know, a lot of public jurisdictions adopted 311 systems. Uh, shortly thereafter, we started to realize that they were, we really were disproportionately benefiting more affluent areas because they were just a louder bullhorn for people to yell about potholes. Uh, but in underserved communities, they weren't using these systems. Um, we see, we're seeing this in restaurant inspections. We're working on analytics and uh, I guess you could call it some, some machine learning on how do we identify potential, uh, you know, outbreaks of foodborne illness sooner. Uh, we're doing, the, us in Chicago are working on this. And <clears throat> what we found is that yes, we could identify things, you know, days sooner, uh, identify more violations, but uh, does that mean we're only going to be inspecting Chinese restaurants in Silver Spring next to a construction site on the hottest day in summer? Because our inspectors will tell us that, yeah, you're most likely, if you focus on particular, you know, smaller, um, you know, mom and pop restaurants near construction sites on hot days. So in order to get those benefits, do we have to disproportionately impact one particular segment of the population? So it's the balance between the controlled equity of a dumb system versus the potential profiling of a smart system that we're trying to understand uh, before we implement these systems. Let's take a question from the audience. Sure. We have a question for Dan Hoffman from Carl. What steps is Montgomery County taking to remove policy barriers to tech solutions? I would say the, the Think Institute, which I referenced, you know, the, the whole pilot prototype proof of concept uh, approach where we try to make it real to residents and policymakers uh, sooner rather than later. Um, you know, a lot of our, our corporate partners are strong supporters of us, but they get a little bit, uh, they get, you know, pilot and prototype fatigue. They don't want to pilot it yet in another place. Uh, but it's the easiest way for us to bring a county council member or the county executive into a place and say, this is, this is it. This is it in a working setting. And look, the sky's not falling. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually working. Um, I would say that's making it real to people is probably the way we're trying to overcome some of those uh, using the lessons we learned from smart meters where the utilities rolled out smart meters and a lot of the public freaked out. They thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to get brain cancer. You're going to hack my smart meter and know when I'm home and you're going to rob me or uh, it's going to catch my house on fire. I'm going to get a brain tumor. Every, all of the paranoia and fear around technology came to a head and laws were passed limiting smart meters. Now just take that benign form of technology and the, and the resistance to it, and now think about an autonomous vehicle. The, uh, you know, 
the, the pushback will be very real, uh, and we have to make it real to people in order to get the folks to adopt it. I had a question related to that because I think one of the things you said during your talk was that residents are expecting these kinds of mm -hmm. technologies and that there will be easy acceptance. So maybe there is some tension there? I, I think you will see it. It'll, there will be, um, there will definitely be friction there. I think in the case of autonomous, where you will see folks begin to accept it is uh, when they get off the plane or they get they leave the airport in a new city and they get their first opportunity to take an autonomous taxi um, they're gonna have seen a bunch of stuff on TV that you know has freaked them out they're gonna see the occasional sensationalized story where an autonomous vehicle you know hit a tree or something um, but they're gonna get take that autonomous uber they're gonna get to their hotel and say oh that wasn't so bad <laughs> and then it, it'll start opening things up so there'll be the early adopters the folks that are just expecting us to have this data or have this ability and then there will be the folks that they need to see it, they need to feel it before they accept it. Another question? Yes, we have a question for Stephen Smith from Colin. Surtrack sounds great. What barriers to implementation are you encountering? Sorry, what barriers to implementation? What barriers, yes. Uh, well, we've actually, um, you know, we, we've had a, a, a lot of great support from the city uh, of Pittsburgh, it's actually been, a, um, I'm thinking of barriers, but we, in a lot of ways we've been luckier than a lot of respects. We've had uh, local foundations uh, supporting our efforts and the city is really progressive and uh, interested in that. Um, I guess uh, we've had some, um, some stumbling blocks as we've moved along. I mean, yeah, truth be told, I, I, when uh, we were first looking at um, uh, this problem and, and, and uh, pilot testing and that, I was really thinking of vehicles. And uh, as soon as we deployed, we realized that there were pedestrians out there also. And, uh, uh, we, you know, we've since taken quite a bit of action to, uh, you know, incorporate that and take that broader perspective. I think it's really learned us. But, uh, uh, you know, it was... Uh, there were a little bit of trying times there at the beginning. There are also bicycles. And bicycles, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a question for you, Steve, as well. Yeah. Um, which is that you talked or you touched briefly on what new AI technologies have made this all possible, yeah. online planning and so on. So can you see those technologies being exported to other applications beyond transportation? Well, I think uh, for sure. I mean, we've even done some work in, uh, in uh, looking at uh, sort of integrating, uh, uh, you know, like sort of taxi services with uh, transit and, and things of that nature. Uh, um, in general, you know, my group works on core technology, so we're, I'm going to say it's applicable widely, right? Uh, well, maybe um, what's the next application? <laughs> well, the next step that what we've been focused on for the last year or so has really been taking advantage of the additional kind of sensing information that we can anticipate is coming from connected vehicle technology. So, um, you know, that, that gives uh, the ability to talk with the vehicles, you know, obviously the first idea is safety there, but uh, we're very interested in the mobility enhancements that we can, can get out of, um, uh, you, you know, out of this extra information. So to give you a, uh, a simple example of a, a recent result we've gotten uh, in simulation at this point, but suppose, um, suppose a connected vehicle is willing to tell the intersection its route. You know, every, you know, a lot of people travel with navigation devices now. It could be an easily automated kind of thing. You just pump your route to the intersection. Well, we can show that, uh, you know, if, it, uh, if a connected vehicle will communicate that route information, we can not only, we can give great benefit in terms of expediting that vehicle through the network, uh, get through a lot faster than otherwise, and, and actually it happens without any adverse effect because, you know, it's, it sounds maybe counterintuitive, but it's, it's really quite simple. You're giving the, the system more information to work with. Now I don't have to guess if you're going to turn left or go straight. I know where you're going to go, so I can I can fold that into the optimization and, and uh, take advantage of that. And so, um, you know, so there are lots of opportunities like that uh, for, for additional kind of coordination and, and, and uh, optimization of traffic flows uh, with this extra information. So. 
yeah, I think to do that, uh, we're going to have to see more of that intelligence at the edge, uh, because if, if we have to bring it all back into our central operating processing center where there still ends up being a human having to make some type of decision right. about the capacity of a certain bus line or whatnot, it's going to, um, it, it, it's not going to make, it's not going to have the, the benefits that we think it will have. I mean, a lot of what we're looking at in the county is, you know, the, these systems as almost nervous systems where if you have, you know, you'll have a faster, just as in your, your body, you'll have a faster reaction if the signal has to travel a shorter distance. And in a county like Montgomery County, uh, where we do have, you know, great coverage for, you know, cellular, great coverage, uh, we have a fiber network, you know, we're working on gigabit fiber, we're going to have great coverage, but we will still run into the power associated with connecting those things. So being able to um, not have to send all of this back, being able to make a lot of these decisions at the edge without having to um, use, you know, some big brain somewhere uh, will, I think, be something that benefits us. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You're meant to tweet the questions over. <laughs> Ah, yes, good question. I don't have one either. There are note cards around. You can walk a note card right over to them with your question. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. This question comes from CCC Vice Chair Beth Minet. What policies need to be in place to prevent automated discrimination for systems that monetize speed of travel? Repeat the question. Yeah. Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> what policies need to be in place to prevent automated discrimination for systems that monetize speed of travel? That monetize, monetize speed, the speed or, yeah. or traffic? Oh. Of travel. Yeah. The speed of travel. The more you pay, the faster you get through the city traffic. You don't have money, you get through. Well, I saw one of the, uh, I think it was your slide about the $50 free Uber ride if you buy at a grocery store. Um, you know, SNAP benefits, supplemental nutritional assistance programs, you know, you get way less than 50 bucks uh, per month. Um, so the, uh, those types of digital inclusion, digital divide questions, I think they're going to fall, you know, very much in the bucket of the, the local jurisdiction, the states, the counties, the cities. <clears throat> and, you know, it's all going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. In the situation of mobility, I think, um, Providing options, uh, you know, if we, there is the danger that, you know, we move away from the hydrocarbon economy, we have autonomous electric vehicles that are amazing and we have a subscription-based service where you don't even own your car and we move back to a single occupancy environment um, where uh, we, we suddenly, you know, the economics behind a public transportation system fall apart. Uh, you know, there is that potential danger where we, the public sector, won't have our intervention tool because that's always been our intervention tool. If you don't, if you can't afford a car, well, here's a bus and here's an affordable ride instead. If we no longer have that intervention, are we just going to sign a contract with Uber? Like, what are we going to do? So, so to address the question, I, I, I'd like to point out the positive aspects of this new technology, right? So I think we, we are in a position where we can give access to mobility to population uh, which don't have access to mobility right now, and that's going to change a lot of things mm -hmm. for them. Now, whether it's slower or faster than for some of the segments of the population, I think that's probably inevitable. Like in other, you know, infrastructure, you have different markets, and you pay for congestions and things like that. So it, it's likely to happen. We don't really know if it's going to happen, but I think the positive side is is really that we are going to enable entire segments of the population to have access to mobility, while at the, at the same point they don't have access now. So sure, they, it's likely that they will be pricing. They are already pricing in different parts of the world. But at the same time, we are giving you know, something that people don't have access to. And I think that's invaluable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, we, we have to remember these very positive points of what the technology can do here. So yeah. Another question? This question is from Joanna Bryson. Will driverless cars help or hurt the demand for public transportation? Well, I think for me, it's very easy. They're going to help tremendously, because they're going to reduce cost. Uh, 
There are many ways it's going to reduce costs first because you don't have to pay the drivers. Most of these public transportation systems that I'm talking about depend on the drivers. You have to pay the drivers, you have to pay you know, all kinds of, of, of things related to that. So if you remove that cost for the systems that we are doing in Canberra, it basically decreases the price by a factor of 10. Uh, there are also a lot of benefits. You know, the cars that you see for you know, uh, autonomous cars, they are much smaller. They, they, they are much more efficient in terms of, of consumptions than the cars that we are driving right now. So, so in a sense, I think it can only be beneficial. It's going to dramatically change the way we, 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 we organize the public transportation system. Pascal's absolutely right. It's not a matter of, and I didn't mean to indicate that public transit would go away, but it needs to adapt. The, the public transit system we know today will, will go away. We run buses that have a capacity for 60 folks, and we run them in, in places like Canberra. We run them in places where we shouldn't run them because that's all we've got to run. Even in uh, Michigan. Exactly. So we've done a lot of research in the last six months specifically on that topic. Was how does the fleet adapt? Do we go to smaller vehicles? Do we even have bus stops anymore? You know, if we're talking about just running something on a route or in a system that, that anticipates demand even, um, you know, how, how does the public then interact with a place where you don't, there is no stop anymore, you just flag it? Uh, all of those questions are things we're trying to figure out before we build, for example, a, a bus rapid transit system like we're planning now um, without future-proofing it first. We have time for one more. Okay, last question. For Dan and Pascal, what nationwide organizations are currently most involved in working on early adoption of shared autonomous vehicle mobility systems in specific local jurisdiction use cases? I'm going to give a quick shout out. Yeah. Uh, Global Cities Team Challenge, uh, if, if NIST, if you're a city or university that aren't involved in that, uh, it's a cross segment, so it's not just transportation. Uh, big Expo next week, NIST and the White House have been, uh, and US Ignite have been awesome supporters of that initiative. I'll also point out the Metro Lab Network, which is a, a, a consortium of city university partnerships actually sprung out of CMU, uh, and they do have an awesome team in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Metro Lab Network, uh, again, kind of announced uh, at the White House uh, with the OSTP's leadership last year. <clears throat> that network of city university partnerships is meant to bring the research you're doing closer to that real world environment. So if you're not involved in one of those, that would be my suggestion. First one is the Global Cities Team Challenge, um, and the second is the Metro Lab Network. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you very much, panelists.